I want you to take your Bibles out tonight and go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. For those of you who are having a hard time finding the book of Revelation, it is the last book in your Bible. If you make it all the way to the index in the back, you have went too far. Right? Revelation chapter 1. Now, uh, we're going to read the first chapter together, and then we'll start. Let me warn you tonight, I'm not even going to scratch the surface of chapter 1. I am probably might not even make it into chapter 1. If I do, it will only be to highlight something that I think... Uh, would be a blessing to you and stir you to want to go home. The other thing I want to tell you, uh, go home and, and study rather. The other thing I want to tell you is do go home and read the book of Revelation as we're going through it. I don't care if you just study chapter 1 as we hit chapter 1 and then move to chapter 2 as we hit chapter 2. But I want you to study along as we go. Now, uh, I can go verse by verse through this book and it will take me over a year to get through it on Wednesday night verse by verse. But the actual best way to study the book of Revelation is not verse by verse. Actually, the most confusing way to study the book of Revelation is verse by verse. The best way to study the book of Revelation is chronologically. So I will be hitting verses. I'll be attacking this book from a chronological perspective. And uh, it will be intense. Uh, I can promise you in four years of Bible college, actually more than that, I never heard any of the information that I'm about to give you. What you got, you've got in your hands has taken me literally thousands of hours of research over the course of years. And what I did is when I decided that I was going to reteach this book, I scrapped all of my notes and I started all over again. So everything you have in your hand is what I've done since last Wednesday night every morning at 4 a.m. So whenever I go and I teach something, I just don't try to regurgitate information. I want God to teach me uh, as I go back through that book. So we're going to be learning together. Y'all got your Bibles out? Amen. Revelation chapter 1. And again, if you didn't get the notes, if you'll just lift your hands, we've got some for you. Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. Say that out loud with me, please. The revelation of Jesus Christ. If you're going to underline anything tonight, that's the one thing I want you to make a note of right there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, washed us from our sin in His own blood, made us kings and priests to His God and Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him, even though they pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him, even so. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation of kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what you see... Write it in a book. Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. 
And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head, his hair were like white wool, and white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if it were refined in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. I want to read that again. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. For years, I have taught that this is possibly the pastor's because of the word there. But I'm convinced more than ever today that these are actually angels that were assigned to each one of these churches. The reason I'm convinced of that is the Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that when we come to church, we need to take care with the attitude we come into the house of the Lord with because of the angels. If that is the case, folks, tonight as we gather in this room, the angel of the Lord is here in this room to listen to our discussion. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? That it's not just us here, but that God has sent an angel to this house to guide us tonight. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the word of God. I pray now that you give me clarity as I speak. I pray now that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is going to say to us tonight. Teach us, Lord. Concerning this apocalyptic book, show us things to come. Make us prophetic people tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It kind of goes without saying, but I put all of this in your notes tonight, that staggering events are going to soon shock the whole world. Right now, as we gather in here, it's interesting to me that Congress is meeting over UFOs and UAPs unidentified phenomena that are flying in the air. They're trying to figure out what is moving in a realm. I've often wondered if these are spirit beings coming in and out of our dimension. But I'm telling you that something is taking place in the atmosphere around the world. And staggering events are going to soon shock the whole world. Great prophecies in the book of Revelation show how and when these catastrophic events are going to occur. And we're going to look at them in great detail. Unrest is right now growing daily around the world. Terrorism is mounting. Bad news is increasing. While good news is increasingly scarce. I don't know about you, but I almost get tired of watching the news because I never hear anything good at all. And the reason for that is because conditions are worsening in our world daily. The Bible says, folks, that things will wax worse and worse as we get close to the end. Man has tapped the power of the atom bomb. Science and technology have seemingly run amok now, producing more horrific new inventions. We're going to look at some of those inventions in these studies. Now more and more countries possess weapons of mass destruction, and now more than ever you can understand as Russia and others have threatened nuclear activity if we get involved in certain parts or theaters of the world. So right now, there is danger that is compounding because of mistrust and strife between nations, and it's growing at a rapid pace. Also, along with that, human decadence, immorality, famine, disease, racism, competition amongst ethnic rivals, crime, violence, all of these things are exploding at exponential rates. 
I want you to realize how prophetic of a generation that we are that we're seeing all of this. And the real question is here, where is all of these downward trends headed toward? Where is all this chaos going to run in the ditch at? The other question I have is, will mankind survive it? And I think that's a good question that we all should ask. Right now, everybody in the world is asking, what does the future hold? Because everybody wants to know. And I want to tell you tonight, there's a lot of people that have opinions. You can find more opinions on Bible prophecy and current events than you can find noses on your face. But not all of these opinions are really good answers. People need answers. And others think that they understand prophecies of the Bible. And whenever I listen to a lot, what a, a lot of other people teach, I'm not trying to be disrespectful here, most of their popular human interpretations of the book of Revelation and prophetic events, they, they're border on ridiculous at best. They're not very scholarly at all. People have not put in very much time. It's almost like they're trying to rip headlines to determine what the Bible says instead of ripping the Bible to determine what the headlines are saying. And because of all this, all of the human interpretations of this book are really bad. So there's not a lot of good material on the book of Revelation. And there's good reason for that. Because it's a difficult book for those who aren't students of the Bible. So what is the truth about prophecy? What does the Bible really say about events that are going to precede Christ's return to the earth? His disciples wanted to know that. And I think that we as His disciples should want to know that right now. You remember His disciples before He left the planet asked Him this, this, this question. What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world or as the, of the end of this age? Folks, Sobering world conditions right now make this question loom larger in our minds than ever before. We all in this room should be asking, when is the sign of His coming? We should literally be looking up knowing that the Lord could come at any moment. Amen. Now, I want you to hear me tonight that nothing that has occurred over the past of 6,000 years even remotely compares to what is about to come on this planet. Nothing. And as we get into the book of Revelation, you're going to be shocked. If we take this book literally, you're going to be shocked at what you're going to hear that is coming on this planet. The Bible foretells a time of world peace. It foretells a, a time of happiness, abundance, and universal prosperity. Now, there's many people who think that there's no hope for this world, but I want to tell you there is hope for the world. But the only hope for the world is Jesus. Amen. Nothing more and nothing less. There is wonderful good news that lies beyond today's bad news. Now, for the world, it's nothing but bad news. Come on, somebody. But for us, the body of Christ, it is good news because we're on the winning side of this thing. And so... I don't want to teach the, the book of Revelation from a doom and gloom perspective. Even though we'll talk about world events and catastrophic things that are going to happen, I want you to understand that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's not the revelation of political events or political parties. It's not the revelation of impending wars. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The purpose of this book is to elevate Jesus. Amen. Amen? And that's what our study is going to be about. Now, before Jesus comes, before this occurs, the world trouble is going to greatly increase. It's going to intensify to staggering proportions. So on the world side, it's going to seem hopeless. But our hope is not in this world. And we have the playbook for the future. I want you to understand that this book that you hold in your hand that we're going to study is the cheat sheet for the test. It's like you walking out of the most difficult class where your professor has told you you're going to have a test tomorrow and you find the professor's notes with all the answers to the test right there on the ground. That's what God has given you in the book of Revelation. He has given you His playbook for the future. 
And all the answers are right there before us. The good news is most of what we're going to study, some of us, most of us, will not experience in this room because I believe the Lord is going to come for us. But no matter what we go through, Jesus is our hope. Say that with me. Jesus is our hope. Um, God has not left mankind without a source of answers that reveals in details what lies ahead. Now, tragically, believing things will eventually turn out all right is foolish because things are not going to eventually turn out all right on the world scale, not till Jesus comes. So we need to be aware of what's getting ready to happen. God understands human nature better than anyone else and where it always leads when it's left to its own devices. This allows Him to know and to guide the awesome future events that are going to occur from now on. What I want you to hear tonight is that everything that is going to happen in this book is by God's divine providence. Hear me. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not the Antichrist, not the devil. In the book of Revelation, the Antichrist is not in charge, and the devil is not in charge, and the false prophet is not in charge. The 200 million man army coming out of the east is not in charge. There is only one who is in charge, who is providential over the affairs of man, and that is God Almighty. So we've got to look at this book from his perspective and not from our perspective. It has become God's time to reveal what lies ahead. You and I are a special group of people in that we're going to study things that other people only dreamed of seeing in their lifetime. And we're able to explain much of what this book means. Now, I want you to look here because I've got a couple of points that's very important. Revelation, first of all, describes soon coming terrible plagues and world shattering, truly earth shattering events you got to take heed. If you do, the Bible makes you a promise. Luke, tw Luke uh, 21, 36, you can be found worthy to escape all of these things. We'll talk about that later on. Signs, seals, symbols, vials, visions, trumpets, thrones, plagues, angels, beasts, heads, horns, witnesses, woes, wars, numbers, multitudes, messages, and mystery. This pretty much sums up the book of Revelation. That's the reason many people believe that the book of Revelation is sealed and closed to understanding. My Church of Christ friends believe that you should not even study the book of Revelation. And there are some denominations that teach that if you study the book of Revelation, you'll actually lose your mind and go insane. So most people believe that the book of Revelation is sealed, closed from understanding. It is called a mystery book without meaning, yet, or they think it's a mystery book without meaning, yet it is an entire book that is important, vital, and full of meaning. Again, the name of the book is not mystery. Come on, what's the name of the book? Revelation. So it is an uncovering, an apocalypso, an uncovering, an unveiling. God's not trying to hide anything. On the contrary, the book is trying to reveal everything that's about to take place, right? This book that you hold in your hand is filled with answers. And the above terms can be unlocked. They can be understood. And this eye-opening booklet or notes that I'm going to give you has keys that's going to help you understand this book. This is why John called it the apocalypse, the unveiling, or the revelation. Now... In the coming days, you're going to be intrigued. You're going to be fascinated. Every time I study this book, I become more fascinated with it. What you're going to be fascinated with is the clarity of what can be known from the book of Revelation. Because most people, under the sound of my voice right now, don't read this book because you don't think it can be understood. But you're going to be shocked at really how clear it is when you take the context of God's Word and you lay it over the top of the book. That's the reason over 250 times the book of Revelation quotes the Old Testament. So the key to understanding the book of Revelation is knowing some passages in the Old Testament. And I'm going to give you some of those important keys in just a moment, right? 
One third, write it down. This is the first blank on your notes here, page number three at the top. One third of the Bible is prophecy. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't think I need to study prophecy. And they'll tell me I'm, I'm a pan theologian. I just believe it'll all pan out, right? Well, that's foolish. If you don't study Bible prophecy, then that means one third of your body, Bible is not applicable to you. One third of your Bible is prophecy, the future written in advance. The Bible is approximately 750,000 words. How I know that is this week I went through and counted every... No, I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's approximately 750,000 words with about 250,000 devoted to many, many prophecies. Almost half the books of the Old Testament are included in either the so-called major Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or minor prophets Hosea, Joel, Amos, Jonah, and Micah. The Apostle Paul explained that the New Testament church was built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. So if you're going to understand the book of Revelation, you're going to have to go to the prophets of the Old Testament. You're going to see next week how important that is because every single trumpet judgment, as the vials are being poured out, every single trumpet judgment was prophesied in the Old Testament. So actually what's probably happening is God is allowing Ezekiel and Zechariah and Daniel and others to come to the sapphire seal of heaven's gates when it's time to pour out that judgment and they're the ones who's blowing that trumpet and pouring out that judgment because they were the ones who were chosen to prophesy it in the Old Testament. We're going to look at that in great detail. Uh, I want you to recognize that since the church stands on the words of the prophets, Christianity must understand prophecy. Underline that in your notes, please. Circle that right there. Since the church stands on the word of the prophets, Christianity has to understand prophecy. Right? Could it be that the reason God's not using us more in the gift of prophecy in the church today is because we don't stand on the prophecies of the scripture that's already been given? You see, if God commands every man to live by every word of God, he would not exclude the full third that is prophecy. What I'm trying to tell you is all of your Bible is important. The prophet Daniel spoke of a time when many shall run to and fro and knowledge would be increased. Daniel chapter 12 verse 4. Then speaking of the end time, listen to this, he said about all of you, the wise shall understand. Daniel, Ezekiel, other major prophets were writing things that they didn't even understand. But they knew there was coming a time in the end when there would be a generation that would understand. Think about how wonderfully awesome that is, that God has allowed you to be that generation that can look at world events that are going on and saying, oh, this was that that was spoken by the prophets of old. Now, Christ directly paraphrased Daniel in the New Testament Olivet Prophecy. This is where he answers the disciples' questions about the sequence of events to occur at the end of the age. He reinforced Daniel's statements about those events by saying, whoso reads let him understand in Matthew 24, 15. So, again, what's the name of the book? Revelation. revelation. It's not a mystery. It is revelation. And God wants you to understand all the prophecies of the Bible. God has opened it up and He has revealed it to His servants, what lies ahead. He wants us to understand it. He does not want us to be confused. It is not His will for us to be ignorant, and it's definitely not His will for us to be fearful of the future, especially when we have the playbook. Right? Now, why did God give us this book? Number one, write this down, all Scripture is inspired and profitable. Again, I've told you there's whole denominations that don't believe in studying this book, and there's large groups of Christians who won't study this book because they think it's difficult and hard to understand. But the Bible says all Scripture is inspired and profitable. Now that's at the top of page 4 if you're trying to follow me tonight. All 66 books, all 66 books 
are worth our effort to study. All 66 books. God does not want you just to study some and others. And the reason I'm saying that, you would be shocked at people who think all they need to do is study the New Testament and never study the Old. All Scripture is inspired. And all Scripture is profitable. So all 66 books are worth our effort to study. God put this book in the canon of Scripture for us to study it. That's why God gave it to us. He intends for us to study it. The second reason God gave us this book is because it guarantees a blessing. Write it down. Number two, it guarantees a blessing. Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse number 3. I want to uh, read it to it. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophet, prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. God guar guarantees a blessing. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the only book in your Bible. Now, I believe you get a blessing from all books, but this is the only book in your Bible that promises a special blessing for those who read, hear, and do the words or keep the words in the book. So, why in the world would you not want to study the only book that has a commanded blessing if you just read it, study it, and try to live it? The third reason that Jesus gave us this book is because Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Write that down. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All future events, everything, rest in Him. He is the spirit of prophecy. Now, there's two perspectives that we've got to look at here when we talk about prophecy, okay? And this is very important as we press through the depths of this book. Number one is the biblical perspective. Write that down, letter A, the biblical perspective. The biblical perspective is, is that we, we, the Bible needs to determine what we think about few, uh, world events, not world events determining what we think the Bible is trying to say. You will get into error if you try to take world events to determine what the Bible is saying. True biblical prophecy study majors on the Bible first. So, it has to have a biblical perspective. The second thing is it has to have also a political perspective. Now, events in our world today uh, literally lay out in 16 chapters of the book of Revelation. They're unfolding in, uh, right before our eyes. 16 chapters of the book of Revelation. 16 of the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation is unfolding before our eyes through political events right now. So you can't just say, I'm going to study the biblical narrative and not study the political narrative. Now, the greatest example of somebody who balanced this well is Daniel. The Bible says that the children of Israel would go into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. How many, how many years did it say go into? 70. 70 years. Daniel, fasting, praying, and studying the prophecies, was able to shorten the captivity of Israel to 68 years. Go do the math. You'll find out I'm telling you the truth or I'll eat the pages in your Bible. 68 years. Why was he able to do that? Because he knew the biblical narrative, the biblical perspective, and he also was a discerner of the political events that were going on during his time. And he put the two together. He realized the prophetic moment that he was in and was able to communicate that to the people. That's what the Bible calls the sons of Issachar. They were discerners of the times and the seasons and knew what they ought to do. Look at me. We need to major on the Bible, but we also cannot stick our head in the sand concerning world events, political parties, and all that stuff. We must be involved on both sides of the coin if we're ever going to come out of this captivity. Now, this book provides clearer detail of Bible prophecy than any other book in your Bible. 
For example, John describes the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ, the governmental operation of the man of sin, the terrible events of the tribulation period, the future position of saints, the city that, it, that Christ is preparing for His church. Folks, without the book of Revelation, we would not have this vital information. So this book is a very clear prophetic book. It is not a book of mystery. Come on, what's its name? It, it is the book of Revelation. Now, why do we need to study this book? Number four, let me give you the fourth one. This is going to really mess with you here. This book completes the circle of Bible truth. This book completes the circle of Bible truth. Notice how many times in Revelation chapter 1 that John and Jesus said he's the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning, and the end. Right? Now, you've got to understand that when John was writing, John was a Jew. So he would have been writing in Greek, but he would have been sending it to the churches. And the Jewish people in churches would have transliterated just like you do. For example, if you read Spanish, but your native language is English, Likely what you do is as you're reading Spanish, you transliterate it in your mind from Spanish to English. Even though John was writing in Koine Greek, the language of the time, the Jews in the church would have been transliterating that into the Hebraic language. So John reaches and grabs the first letter and the last letter of the Greek language, Alpha and Omega. But the Jew, when he transliterated it, would have said he's the Aleph Tav. Now, Hebraic alphabets have pictographs. They have a pictorial side. If you take the Aleph and the Tav and you put it together, it makes an unending circle. So Jesus was, or John and Jesus wasn't just saying, I'm the beginning and the end. He's not just the bookend on each side of time. What he was saying is, I'm Alpha Omega, but again, the Aleph Tav encompasses everything. He's saying literally, I'm A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, L, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Now I know my ABCs. Next time, won't you sing with me? Right? In other words, what he was saying is, I am time. I am everything. So when Jesus was saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the Jew was putting those together and saying, no, no, no. He's everything. He's the whole circle. He's the circle of life. <laughs> Y'all are making my teaching really hard, okay? <laughs> it's corny, but it's got to work. Now, let me show you how that plays out. Look at this. In Genesis, it shows humanity beginning in a beautiful paradise. How does Revelation end? It shows in this wonderfully beautiful paradise. Genesis shows how human beings lost a chance to eat of the tree of life. What does Revelation do? It ends showing mankind eating of the tree of life. Genesis tells of humanity's first rebellion against God. What does Revelation do? It promises an end to humanity's rebellion against God and never to happen ever again. Genesis records the first murder, the first drunkard, the first rebel. Revelation promises that we'll live in a city where nothing impure will ever be there and none of those folks will ever be in that city. It is, it completes the circle of Bible truth. So why in the world would we not want to study it when it's profitable, when it's inspired, when it guarantees a blessing, when Jesus is the spirit behind the book, when it gives us biblical and political perspectives of what he thinks about things, and it completes the whole circle of Bible truth. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is you cannot appreciate the Bible without doing some study in the book of Revelation. Now, let's look at the author and the setting and uh, the timeline and the time frame. Again, number one, it's called the book of Revelation. It was written, write this down, by the Apostle John. By the Apostle John. It's called, in Greek, the Apocalypse 
which literally means the unveiling or disclosure. Uh, this profound book contains 22 chapters and is the last book of the New Testament of the Bible. Now, when John wrote this book, John was a pastor in Ephesus, later captured and was taken and exiled on the Isle of Patmos. This book was written, and we'll look at it in more detail in a moment, around 95, or, or completed around 95 AD, which means John would have been almost 95 years old when he got off the island of Patmos. I want you to think about that in a moment when we talk about how bad Patmos was. Okay? Now it's a beautiful place. Now there's at least 365 churches on Patmos, one for every day of the week. You think those people over believe that the book of Revelation is an important book? They built churches all over uh, the island. Now John evidently had relationships with all seven of the churches that are mentioned. <clears throat> so some Bible scholars believe that John was probably an itinerant, almost what we would call a circuit-riding preacher, a circuit-riding apostle. So he would have went to all of these seven churches that are located in Asia Minor that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, and we'll study about those in the next week or so. But he was the pastor at Ephesus. So when John got off, let me just give you a little story here that will bless you. When John got off of Patmos, he went back to Ephesus. As an old man, 95, 96 years old, all of the churches would gather together to hear the last living apostle preach. And history records that these massive crowds would come together to hear this old man. He would have to be assisted in on canes, brought and set in front of all of the congregation where they were gathered. And people would sit on the edge of their chairs to hear about the revelation of the apocalypse. All of the visions, the dreams, the symbols, the mystery. They wanted to hear about it all. By this time, the letters had been scattered throughout the churches. They had read them. They had studied them. They wanted him to give clarity to some things. And so people would gather by the hundreds and thousands to hear John speak. They would bring John in, 95-year-old man. You can imagine what he must have looked like. He would sit down. And all he would say was this, Beloved, let us love one another. He ended his life, that being his message. His message was not the book of Revelation. His, book, his message was to the churches, Let's love one another, for this is the sum total of everything. Right? So, John was this unbelievable character. You do realize that he was an apostle who was boiled in oil before he was exiled, exiled to Patmos, and they couldn't kill him. So you know that the Roman Empire must have hated John. They exiled him to Patmos. Patmos was a place for prisoners. It wasn't a beautiful island like it is today in Greece. It was a, it was a prisoner's camp. And every night they would turn out wild dogs that they had starved to go eat the prisoners. And, and writers say that you could hear the screams of prisoners every single night. And here's a 90, 92, 93, 94, 95 year old man who's stuck on this and wild dogs won't even touch him. God had his hand on this man so that you and I could have this book that we hold in our hands tonight. I'm trying to get a point across to you. This is not a book of mystery. This is the book of <coughs> Revelation, right? Now, this book reveals Jesus in three ways. It reveals His person. It reveals His power. It also reveals His program. We'll look at all of those dimensions later. Number three, this book uh, records the account of John's vision that he experienced while prisoner on the island of Pat Patmos in the Aegean Sea that's right off the coast of uh, Turkey. Again, and point number A there, Clement said, and this is one of the early church fathers said that John returned to Patmos, or returned from Patmos, <coughs> excuse me, to Ephesus <coughs> in 96 AD after the death of Domitian. Arrhenius states that John died in Ephesus after returning from Patmos. Isn't it amazing you can live through all of that turmoil and crazy hell only to go home and just die in peace? 
Pretty amazing. Now, point number four. The book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. The revealing of Christ as high priest, the revealing of Christ as prophet and judge, and the revealing of Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. <coughs> Excuse me, let me clear my throat. <coughs> Tis the season for allergies. Revelation records events in two primary arenas. Now this, this is where we get into some important information here. First of all, the terrestrial or the earthly arena. And it also records the celestial or the heavenly arena. So write those down. The terrestrial, earthly arena. The celestial, the heavenly arena. Confusion comes when the student does not discern which arena the events are taking place in. So almost every person I've ever talked to in, in Bible prophecy, either it's an interpretation issue on uh, the ways to interpret the book of Revelation, or it's an issue where they don't understand the arenas that God is communicating in. I'm going to help you get through all of that, and you'll never have that problem again. And you can, uh, you can buy me dinner one night for it, all right? Let me give you some interpretation of the book of Revelation. This is where the confusion comes in with the book, how to interpret it. Number one, the first way to interpret the book of Revelation, write this down, is historical interpretation. Historical. Some teach that the book has already been fulfilled through the past 200 years of history, or 2,000 years of history. The Seventh-day Adventists use this interpretation, and as we will see, this is not a correct interpretation, and it leads to a lot of erroneous teachings, a lot of erroneous teachings, all right? Historical interpretation. Then there is something that's akin to historical interpretation, but it's not the same. Write this down. It's preterist interpretation. I'm going to spell it for you. P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T. -E preterist interpretation. Now let me define what preterism is because this is where the bulk of the confusion comes from with the book of Revelation. Preterism is a Christian eschatological view, that's simply a big term that means end times view, that interprets some partial preterism or full preterism prophecies of the Bible as events which have already happened. Now this school of thought interprets the book of Daniel as referring to events that happened from the 7th, B, 7th century B.C. until the 1st century A.D. during the period of the Maccabees, right? So they'll talk about Daniel's prophecies happening during that time frame, right? That's how they interpret it. At the same time, they see the, the events of the book of Revelation happening during the 1st century, and culminating at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., right? So preterism looks at, everybody look right here, looks at the prophecies of Daniel as happening from the 7th to the 1st century, pretty much during the Maccabean period. The prophecies that Jesus talked about and the prophecies of the book of Revelation happening at 70 A.D. when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Right? So I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about some of the things. And you'll if you if you get that one, two, one of the one or two of these points, when people start talking, immediately you'll be able to say, Oh, that's they're interpreting it this way, and it'll give you an understanding of where they at so you can talk about the, the book, right? The third way to interpret the book is the allegorical interpretation. Am I boring you guys? Yeah. Allegorical interpretation. One of the things that bothers me about a lot of church folks, they don't want to study. We need, we need to be people who are people of the word, right? Allegorical interpretation. Now this doctrine states that each chapter contains a spiritual truth, but the words cannot be taken literally. And although this book does contain many spiritual truths, this is still an improper interpretation. You can't make the entire book of Revelation, an allegorical book alone, and understand it. It'll, it'll cause a lot of confusion for you. Number four, the fourth interpretation is spiritual interpretation. Now, this is all the different ways that people look at this book, spiritual interpretation. This method of interpretation is similar to allegorical. According to this method, the chapters all contain a spiritual truth that can be applied 
to practical living. This method of interpretation is the source of replacement theology. Now, replacement theology basically says that the church has taken the place of the nation of Israel and that there's really no need to even focus on Israel as a nation or the Jewish people as God's people. This is an extremely demonic view. By the way, would you like to know the church father who espoused this the most? Martin Luther, the man who taught grace the most. In fact, Martin Luther wrote a treaty called the 95, or called, uh, not 95 Thesis, but a treaty on the Jews and dedicated, uh, or uh, Hitler rather, dedicated the Holocaust to Martin Luther and took the playbook out of Martin Luther's pamphlet on the treaty of the Jews. So here we are in the modern church hailing these some of these church fathers who might have introduced a good truth but was in so much error that they were responsible for killing God's people. This is why prophecy and the interpretation of prophecy is extremely important. And it's got to be right, okay? Now then there's the literal interpretation. Now this is my method of interpreting and I'll tell you why later? This method is the most correct and complete method for interpreting the book, in my opinion. This book contains a revelation concerning the time of the end and its events involving the tribulation and second coming of Christ. This is clearly, in my mind, the correct method of interpreting, interpreting uh, the book of, of Revelation. So when I look at this book, I look at everything literal. Now, if there's a symbol, anytime there's a symbol... In apocalyptic literature, it is always defined within the apocalyptic literature of what the symbol actually means. So that, that, if that's the case, then I can look at every symbol, I can find the definition, and I can take it literally. All right. Now, I just mentioned something that a lot of us have never studied before, and it's kind of weird apocalyptic literature. Y'all feel like you're in college, don't you? I can see it already. You're... Smoke coming out of your ears already. So this is this is not bad stuff. We need to we need this is all very important before we jump into the depths of this book. You've got to have an understanding of apocalyptic literature. You see, the biblical record, or the biblical the Bible rather records the human race. Now we have six to ten thousand years of written record in the Bible of the human race. And it breaks it down dealing with three people groups. So I want you to write this down. Number one, or letter A here, first of all, in the Bible is the Gentile area. Era, the Gentile era. Now a lot of people think, no, it would be the Jewish area. Well, Jews didn't come into play till long after that. Actually, 2,000 years. 2,000 years. How many years? Those are going to become important numbers uh, as we get down the road. So the Gentile area is the first 2,000 years of human history. This goes from creation to Abraham, basically from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 12. Can you believe that 12 chapters in your Bible, the first 12 chapters, covers 2,000 years of human history? And it's all Gentiles. Abraham was from Ur of Chaldees. He was a pagan. He was a Babylonian, right? Right? And God saved him and brought him out of the land. So God started with Gentiles. Then we come to letter B, the Jewish era. The Jewish era. Now this goes from Genesis chapter 12 to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And that's not to imply that God's not still working with the Jewish people. We all in this room know that God never stops working with his people. I'm just giving you parameters within scripture here. Now, during this area, era, you have Gentiles and Jews. So now God's dealing with two groups of people. He's dealing with Jewish folks and He's dealing with Gentile folks. Gentile is everybody who's not a Jew. How many of you in here are not a Jew? You little miserable Gentiles, right? <laughs> so notice God starts with Gentiles. Now, all of this is very important. 
Then God brings in the Jewish people. And then he works for thousands of years with Gentiles and Jews. Almost four, uh, almost uh, another 2,000 years to be exact. But then we have Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And from Acts chapter 2 to Revelation chapter 22, guess what God's now dealing with? Gentiles, Jews, and Christians. These people who believe on Jesus as their Messiah. Now why am I bringing this into play? Because whenever you study apocalyptic uh, literature, scriptures, that deal with prophecy. You have to discern who's God talking to here. Is he talking to the Gentiles? Is he talking to the Jews? Is he talking to Gentiles and Jews? Is he talking to Christians? Who's he talking to here? If you don't know who the audience is, then what you'll do is you'll have to twist Scripture to make it fit your interpretation. So what I just taught you in the interpretations of the book of Revelation and understanding apocalyptic literature and how God has dealt with humankind and how these scriptures apply, listen to me, just change your life when it comes to understanding Bible prophecy. Because now, all you got to do is figure out who's God talking to. If God's talking to all three groups, is God talking to just Gentiles or is God talking to, to the Jewish people? That's very important. And you're going to see how important that is Sunday when I preach a, 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 a message about revelation being based on relationship. Because God doesn't tell some people some things. If you don't believe that, come Sunday with an open mind and I'm going to mess with your thinking. Right? All right. So does everybody see this? Now, there are four apocalyptic books in your Bible. Four apocalyptic books. Now, there's, there's apoc apocalyptic utterances or prophetic utterances that have to do with the end time, but mainly there's four books. Number one is Zechariah. Number two is Daniel. Now, here's what's interesting. The timeline, write this down, the timeline for the Gentiles is in the book of Daniel. So when you study the prophecies of Daniel, guess who he's dealing with? Gentiles. That's very, very important. Now, this starts with the Babylonian captivity and it takes the Gentiles all the way into eternity future. The prophecies of Ezekiel, letter C, deals with the timeline for the Jewish people. It starts with the Babylonian captivity and it deals with the Jews all the way into eternity future. Revelation, shockingly, is a timeline for the Christians. Now do you see why I'm doing all of this? Because all of this is very important for us to understand. It, it, it starts with the resurrection of Christ and it takes Christians into eternity future. So you, I guess what I'm trying to teach you tonight is you can't just take apocalyptic scripture and Bible prophecy and lay it over every people group or every nation and say this applies to everybody and get a correct interpretation. Context matters. Your audience matters. That's the reason that we're looking at all of this, all right? Now let me give you a secret to interpreting the book of Revelation. Y'all stay with me. We're almost done. On your notes, you see that word says conclusion down there? Let me tell you what that means to a preacher. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> the secret to clear scriptural understanding of all, the, all these things is to keep things in each division of the book to which they belong. This is the reason I said the best way to study the book of Revelation is not necessarily verse by verse because you have chapters with interluding things that are happening some happening in heaven, some happening on the earth. Remember we talked about some celestial, some terrestrial. Some's happening in heaven, some happening on the earth. Some is retroactively looking back. Some's, you know, looking forward. And you've got to make sure that it stays within the right division of the book. The most important key to understanding and studying the, this divine book is its key verse, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 19. I want us to go over there tonight. Revelation chapter 1. 
verse number 19. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. This is the key. Because this book is broken up into three divisions. The things that you have seen, past, the things which are, the present, and the things which shall be the future. So when you're studying this book, you've got to determine, is God talk, who's God talking to here? Is God talking to the past, the present, the future? When is, when is it happening? All of these things are so important when it comes to biblical interpretation. I'm giving, listen, folks, I'm giving you my secret to how I come up with every message. This process that I'm giving you right now is how I study the Bible every single day of my life and get all the messages that I get. People come up and say, well, how do you study the Bible? Right there it is. You got it. There's my secret. Now, Revelation has a road map of prophecy, in my opinion. Now, Brother Connor here has a different road map. And he and I, this is Connor. He's my prophecy buddy. And we get together and I tell him all the ways that he's wrong every time we get together. <laughs> and he tries to tell me and I say, no, you have a right to be wrong, Connor. And so, but anyway... Nobody has all the answers. So here's what Connor and I always end up saying. Somewhere between what he thinks and what I think is probably close to what it actually is. But we've got to be open to talk about some of these things and to discuss them. So what I'm about to give you is my view of Revelation's roadmap of prophecy. Number one, the next great event of human history. So this is, this is the next great event of human history is the rapture of the church, the catching away of the saints. This will take place in our study, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. I'll lay out for you why I think that is. I will also lay out for you why Connor thinks it isn't. Right? And he's, his arguments are just as good as my arguments. So, listen, it's not my job to tell you what the truth is. It's my job to teach you and the Holy Ghost, you and the Holy Ghost get together and you discover what the truth is, right? I'm not the Holy Ghost in your life. I'm just pastor. And there is a difference, right? So, watch now. Revelation chapter 1. Everybody look right here. Revelation chapter 1 is the introduction of the book and who wrote the book and how it came, how the revelation came forward. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. John is writing. Jesus is talking. And John is writing to the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. One of the most powerful studies we're ever going to do, and we'll probably start it next week, is when we look at these seven churches. You will be blown away by what you see in those seven churches because these seven churches don't just represent the seven churches in Asia Minor. This is a prophetic book for our time, right? So watch. He writes the things which has been, Revelation chapter 1, the things which are in his time, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Revelation chapter 4, all the way to Revelation chapter 22, is the future. The next great event of the future, in my opinion, will be the rapture of the church. That happens, I believe, in Revelation chapter 4. After that, we know that there's going to be seven years of tribulation period out in your notes, out beside that, if you want to write the appearance of the Antichrist. He will come on the scene. I was asking the Lord one time, is all right for me just kind of break away? I was asking the Lord one time, I said, Lord, did you... Uh, does, does, Satan, does Satan know when this is going to happen and he knows who the Antichrist is going to be? How, how does this happen? Because it seems like you're, you're the only one that's sovereign that knows the end from the beginning. Satan doesn't have an... Uh, he's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. Does Satan have somebody that he's positioned or he, is he able to create somebody? How is that going to happen? And the Lord spoke this to me. I believe it really was the Lord. He said, he said to me, in my inner man, he said, No, in every generation, Satan has groomed an Antichrist. In every generation, Satan has groomed an Antichrist because he does not know when the Lord will come. So he has to prepare an Antichrist in every generation to take the platform because he does not know when the Lord is coming. Isn't that good? So, that explains why 
in every generation, you've had people say, this could be the Antichrist, this could be the Antichrist. It could actually be that Satan was grooming certain individuals to be the Antichrist. Maybe some of these Bible prophecy preachers weren't all crazy, weren't all wrong, had the Lord come at that moment. Because the Bible says in Thessalonians, he that letteth will let to be taken out of the way. Then that man of sin shall be revealed. The Antichrist cannot come, in my viewpoint, until uh, the church is taken out of the way. So it would make sense that Satan would have to groom an Antichrist in every generation if he does not know when Jesus is coming. So right now, an Antichrist is alive amongst us. He's already been groomed for it. If Jesus comes tomorrow, the Antichrist will take the stage and he will have been prepared by Satan for it. If Jesus tarries another 500 years, and I don't see how that's possible, but if he tarries another 500 years, Satan will still be grooming an Antichrist for the catching away. Selah. Right? So watch, the rapture takes place, seven years of tribulation. Watch this. That is pretty much in your Bible, Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 19. Look how easy the book of Revelation just got. Revelation chapter 1 is the introduction of the book and the message. Revelation chapter 2 to chapter 3 is writing to the seven churches that were in his day. Revelation chapter 4, the catching away of the church. Revelation chapter... Uh, Four or through verse or through Revelation uh, nineteen is now or sixteen rather is the uh, is the tribulation period, and then watch this we come to the judgment or the or the return of Christ rather the return of Christ. This is Revelation chapter nineteen verse number eleven. Now this is when Christ comes at the end of the tribulation period, sets up his kingdom, and. There will be a 1,000 year reign. That's Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 6. And then at the end of this 1,000 year reign, watch this, then we'll have the judgment. The judgment is Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And then after the judgment, we all go into the eternal perfect state, the new heaven and the new earth. I basically, in five minutes, just gave you a whole understanding of the book of Revelation. Now everything else is just signs and symbols and prophetic utterances that all you got to do is take Scripture and interpret Scripture with, and you'll get a full understanding of the entire book. It's really that simple. Because it's not called the book of mystery. It is the book of what? Revelation. Revelation. All right. Let me give you a couple special suggestions, and then I'm going to show you one, one really cool thing in Revelation chapter 1. Special suggestions for studying the book. Number one, you must remember that the whole focus of this book can be found in its title, Revelation. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not trying to reveal coming events, the Antichrist, etc. The complete focus of Revelation is to use events, symbols, and people to reveal the eternal Son of God. So when you study the book of Revelation over the next coming weeks and months, what I want you to do is every time you read it, find Jesus in every verse. Find Jesus in every verse. Second thing you need to do is you need to follow the golden rule of interpretation. Now let me tell you what that is. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. This is the golden rule of interpretation. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Don't try to make the Bible harder than it is. Take every word as its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning unless the facts of the immediate text studied in light of related past fundamental truths clearly indicate otherwise. Let the Bible interpret the Bible, folks. And use common sense. If it says it, just believe it. Don't try to read something into a passage. Just believe what it says. And then when it says something that you don't understand, find other scripture that will interpret it for you. Okay? Now, part of this is the language of the book, understanding the language of the book. First of all, there's the literal language of the book. If the interpretation of a word or phrase is literal, it will agree with other words and passages throughout the whole Bible. Right? One of my primary ways of studying the Bible is something called word study. So when I find a word, 
I'll find it in other passages of the Bible, and I'll look at how it's used. For example, I did this at the onset when we talked about to the angel of the church, right? I said, I believe that that's actually an angel and not just a man there. Where did I come to that conclusion? Through word studies of that, that word. Secondly is analogy. This, this means that certain words or phrases are used to describe something by using a symbol. Again, in apocalyptic scripture, apocalyptic uh, text, whenever there is a symbol, there is always within the book somewhere an interpretation of that symbol. You get this with Daniel and Ezekiel and you start having these beasts and different animals and you don't know what they are. All you got to do is put them together and you figure out what each one of these animals represent, what nation. It's, it's very plain. You just have to do a little study. And then there's the symbolic meaning. The symbolism in the book will always interpret itself either in the text or in other references throughout the Bible. So you've got the Bible to interpret the entire book. You've got 65 commentaries. To give you the interpretation of the entire book. All right, let me sum this up. All biblical symbolism can be understood and interpreted by one or more or a combination of three different ways. Write this down, very important. Number one, the text itself. The text itself. Usually a symbol will be interpreted within the text itself. Look for it. Where? In the text itself. Let me give you another law when it comes to interpretation. The law of first mention. Write that down. The law of first mention. If the text is unclear, find where that word or that phrase is mentioned the first time in your Bible. Find where it is. Just do, do, You've got this powerful tool in your hand. If I would have had... If I would have had my iPhone in Bible college, I'd have been the most brilliant Bible teacher on the planet. I had to go look through hours and hours of microfish. Anybody remember microfish? Some of you young ones have no idea what a microfish is. It's not something that swims in the ocean, trust me. Right? Read thousands of articles just to find something. Now, you've got a phone and on my phone, I've got a Bible app, and I've got Strong's, and I've got uh, Erdman's, and several other commentaries within that, and I can literally just push buttons and immediately find where it's first mentioned in the Bible. There's no excuse for biblical illiteracy. Not in our generation. All right, let me give you a last one. Other related scriptures. Examine scriptures comparing scripture with scripture. These are your rules of interpretation. This will be our rules of interpretation of this book. Now, I want everybody to go in your Bible, Revelation chapter 1. I got four minutes and I'm fixing to lay something heavy on you. Show you just how wonderful the book actually is. Now, I know some of that was grueling work tonight, but welcome to deep Bible study. Right? Y'all let me know when you get to Revelation chapter 1. Verse number 9, Revelation 1, 9. Y'all ready for this? It's a wonderful truth bomb right here. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation, kingdom patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island called Patmos. The word Patmos means the place of my killing. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit on the... Lord's Day, and I heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet, right? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What's the Lord's Day? No. The Sabbath is Saturday. Again, use Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Lord's Day, Sunday. That was the Lord's Day, right? So, John was caught up in the Spirit on what day? Sunday, Sunday right? So watch this now. I heard behind me a loud voice. All right, Connor, I need you to come right here. Stand right here. Stand right there. I heard behind me a loud voice. Verse number 11. Saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book. Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. 
Now watch. Everybody look right here. I'm going to read it and you just listen. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, watch now, verse 12, I saw seven golden lampstands. Look now. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, so this is Jesus, clothed with a garment down the feet, girded about the chest with a golden bed. His head was like and hair like a wool, as white as snow, his eyes were like flame out, his feet were like fine brass, yada, yada, yada. Verse 16, he had in his hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun shining in the street. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet, and he laid his hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, I'm the first and last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Now, remember how I talk about letting symbolism interpret things? Let me see if you were listening when we read Revelation chapter 1. The candlesticks represented what? The seven candlesticks. Because it, how do we know the candlesticks represent the church? Because that's what the text says. <laughs> so, when it's plain sense makes common sense, we add no more sense to it. Are you following me? I'm giving you an example of what I'm saying here. But watch. The candlesticks represent what? The The churches. Now, John was caught up in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Day. Now, look at me. Where, Where were candlesticks? Where we hear candlesticks mentioned in the Old Covenant? I want to see how smart the Bible says. In the temple or the tabernacle, right? Ah, where were the candlesticks? They were in the inner court. So look at I'm going to give you a deep truth here. So watch. In the temple of the Old Testament, this is the reason we need to know the old to go with the new. Oh, I'm fixing to drop a bomb on you. In the temple, you had the outer court, which had an a, a altar sacrifice, a laver. You go through a veil. You come into the second section, which was the inner court. Inner court had the table of showbread, the uh, candlesticks right here, the altar of incense. There was a veil. You went through that veil. Guess what you did? You went into the Holy of Holies. Watch. John said he had to turn to see the voice that spoke with him. Where was he? Behind him. And what did he see? Candles. So in heaven, there is a heavenly temple. And that heavenly temple was the same pattern that God gave to Moses to build the earthly tabernacle and temple. Watch now. This is only in the first chapter. The outer court had the altar of sacrifice, the laver. The inner court had the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and what? So where was the candlesticks in the temple? The inner court. If John had to turn to see the voice that spoke with him, then John was in the throne room. He was in the Holy of Holies in heaven. Or he was in worship. But probably in the Holy of Holies. And this is the reason that you need to know... No, 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 no. no, no. I'm fixing I'm to burn both these theologians. This is the reason you need to know your Bible because in the book of Hebrews, whenever God rent the veil, He moved the furniture. We'll talk about it later, baby. I'm serious. God moved the furniture. Watch this. When God, y'all better listen to this, when God rent the veil, He took the altar of incense and He put it beside the throne. Go read it. If I'm lying, I'll eat the pages in your Bible. That's the reason people who say they don't want to worship don't understand. They don't understand throne room living. (laughs) Speak up again in the service, baby. It's good. (laughs) We do this all the time. So watch now. So this means John was in the Holy of Holies in heaven. 
in the heavenly temple. And he heard what? Voice. voice behind him. And he turned to see. So watch. He sees what standing there? He sees seven candlesticks. What do the candlesticks represent the church? Represent? The churches. Look at me. Look at me. In God's plan, the church is only in the second dimension of glory. There's a whole nother level than this. So when Jerry was prophesying, y'all are, we need to stop being a service-driven church and a presence-driven church. There is a dimension in God where we can get beyond this and watch, go from glory to So look at this. Don't you know how frustrating it was for John to be in the Holy of Holies and to have to go back? Y'all got to get your act together. So look at me. The seven churches, when we get to studying in the next few days, the seven churches and the letters to the seven churches are telling them how to get from this dimension to that dimension. Are you with me? That's just one little part of Revelation chapter 1. And that is all through the book of Revelation. Right? My God, son. Just hit silent. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. You can go be seated. (laughs) So, let's pray. I got to get you out here because those babies downstairs are going to be climbing the walls and the nursery workers are going to kick me out of pastry. Y'all learned anything tonight? Yes. Is everybody okay? Yes. Yeah, everybody says they want to learn this stuff, and I start dealing with it, and they're like, I don't want to know all that stuff. I just want you to tell me about dragons and snakes and all this stuff. We'll get to the dragons and the snakes next week. I promise. Let me pray over. Father, I thank you for everybody in this room. I bless them. Thank you, God, that there's people here that are hungry to know truth. Now, Father, as they study the book of Revelation over the coming weeks, open the book up to them like they never had it, be, uh, had it opened up to them. Let them see things they've never seen. Let them hear things they've never heard. Take them into heavenly places they've never dwelt in before. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, guys, I love y'all. Get out of here. Thank you for studying the Bible with me tonight. Don't forget, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, join me on YouTube.